All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our conversations with the mediator. Uh, you're very welcome to join us here this afternoon. Um, I'm Mike Talbot, the founder and CEO of UK Mediation, and our mediator today for conversations with the mediator is Diane Nicholson. So Diane is here. We're going to be having a chat for the next um, 35, 40 minutes or so. Um, you, if you would like to, we try and make these events interactive, so you are invited to put your camera on. There's no um, absolute, we don't insist on it, we probably couldn't insist on it, but if you would like to put your camera on, it's great. We can be fine, we get a little bit more interaction. Uh, we are recording, um, just to let you know, um, and it will be available online uh, afterwards. So the message for people who couldn't get here, to, uh, the um, webinar for people who couldn't get here today, uh, will be uh, will be available online. So you are being recorded. Um, also, if you would like to chip in, which we encourage you to do, um, try and make these things interactive, like I say, um, down the bottom of the Zoom screen, the third button along uh, in the sort of middle cluster of buttons, it says React. And if you click on React, for those who don't know, um, you will see a raise hand. So pop your hand up. And if we get a chance, we'll come to you. Can't guarantee we'll get around everybody, but if you pop your hand up and then at a, a convenient moment, we'll to hopefully get around to you to make a comment uh, or ask a question or chip in whatever you'd like to chip in. Any questions to me or questions to Diane? I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for Diane. Um, chat box is open as well over on the side there. Um, my colleague Scott is on with us. So um, uh, Scott can manage the chat box over there for us, or if I see something pop up, we can refer to it as well. Okay, enough admin. So over really to Diane. So Diane's been with us um, since the beginning of 2019 um, as one of our uh, esteemed mediators and trainers. Um, and we're gonna talk a bit about Diane's experience, Diane's background, what Diane has been doing for UK mediation. And a bit later on, um, we'll talk about a case, anonymized, uh, of course, so that uh, hopefully nobody would recognize who it was or where it was. Um, and we'll get into the case. So to talk about the experiences of a mediator, which is what these conversations are really about, is to think about the diversity um, of the backgrounds of mediators who work for UK mediation kind of things they bring to the party, uh, the sorts of work they're doing with us, and really sort of the, the thoughts and experiences of a, a real practicing mediator. Okay, so Diane, great to have you join us today. Thanks ever so much for coming along. Um, perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about your backgrounds, your sort of early training and qualifications, your sort of career before you came to UK mediation. So over to you. Thank you very much, Mike. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, and thank you everyone for, for coming today to this. Um, as Mike said, I'm a trainer and mediator with UK Mediation and I work freelance with other providers as well. My background, I guess, started with my undergraduate degree. So I did psychology and human biology and then went on to do a postgraduate diploma in a uh, no, certificate in psychology with the with the vague idea that I was going to become a chartered psychologist. And from there, I got a job as a psychological assistant in a category B men's prison. So my primary role there was delivering offending behaviour programmes. So for anyone not familiar with that, it's uh, they are... Uh, CBT based interventions looking at attitudes, thinking and behaviours associated with crime and reducing reoffending. Okay, so this was my first introduction really into conflict and the psychology of conflict. So not just the content of those courses, because a lot of the concepts and theory that we looked at on there would be quite similar to the stuff that some of the stuff that you would look at on your mediation training but also the facilitation of that as you can imagine um, quite a challenging environment to work in and also manage the the dynamics within a group of, of people some of whom really don't want to be there uh, others might have a bit more self-awareness so yeah the, the content side of it and also the management of um, the training as well. Mm. So that was my first introduction. And then from there, I went into management quite quickly. Um, I was a resettlement manager for a time and then I ended up being 
intervention services manager as part of the psychological services team. So I was responsible for the, the, the team delivering the offending behaviour programmes and a few other interventions as well. So I think the most people I managed at one point was about 17. So I guess that's another introduction into conflict, challenging environment, quite a competitive environment to work in as well. So I had a lot of experience managing people through or supporting people through HR processes. Mm. Um, I had quite a few complex and sensitive cases, actually. And that prompted me to do my level five diploma in HR management rather than do a leadership and management mm. qualification. I thought that would hold me in, in better stead. And that's been actually really helpful in the role as a mediator as well. So I was pleased that I, I did that. Um, yeah, so conflict in teams, people management, that side of stuff kind of added an extra layer to my experience. I had quite a few different roles uh, in addition to the management role. So one of them was case manager for people in custody who were at risk of self-harm and suicide. So I worked with different departments to kind of manage a, a care plan to support people through recovery. And um, that's just one of the roles that I did. Um, in the resettlement role, I set up quite a few initiatives and partnership working agreements with statutory and non-statutory organisations. Mm -hmm. nope. And I was also responsible for the restorative justice service. Mm -hmm. And that's what prompted me to do my mediation training. So that, that was our first contact with you really, Di. It was um, thinking about uh, once you trained in mediation, you were looking at setting up a mediation service um, within the prison. Um, yeah. So initially, my motivation for it was to provide an alternative intervention to RJ. Um, so kind of similar process, but with, with restorative justice, it, for those who don't know, it is victim-centred, so there needs to be a clearly defined victim. And we were finding that that wasn't always the case. There were cases where family members or communities were involved yeah. in the offence. There wasn't kind of clear blame. Other people were involved. Other people had received convictions. And I saw the potential for growth, really. Um, so while RJ is victim-centred, I worked in reducing reoffending, so I was constantly thinking of you know different interventions that, that might be helpful. So I did want to provide that opportunity where there were cases where there was an ongoing relationship between two parties or, or more mm. so that we were able to um, offer people the opportunity to, to repair some of the harm done by um, by the situation. So that's what prompted me. Yeah, I think some of the, the, the joy of doing these conversations with a mediator is to hear the sort of the range of backgrounds that our mediators come from um, and the range of applications of mediation as well, not just within our company, but elsewhere. I think there's um, uh, it's often not recognised the value of using mediation in um, the sort of um, criminal justice system and within prisons in particular. There's a couple of projects that we've been involved in. One was with uh, a prison where people who misuse drugs and alcohol who are on reduction programmes, when they come out, um, can often have conflict with the family. The family has moved on. Things might have changed at home. Um, <clears throat> the offender having been released, gets back into that setting, there's a lot of conflict. They might end up leaving the family home or um, having you know, quite significant conflict with the family home to the point where they come up against, um, uh, you know, come up against with the police again. Um, and the first thing that person's going to do is to go out and misuse drugs and alcohol. So they end up back inside. So that revolving door and trying to break, the idea of that was using mediation to try and break that, to resolve the conflict with the family. Um, so that, that person had a greater chance of actually, um, you know, enmeshing back within that support network when they got out of prison and hopefully didn't end up going back inside. Yeah, 100 percent. And that was one of the other things I wanted to, to look at as well. So we offered a counselling service for people being released. Um, and this was a Cat B prison. People were serving four years or more, so possibly served quite a, a number of years in custody. And, and like you say, the aim was to try and get people into accommodation on release and ideally going back into the family home. Mm -hmm. um, but those issues were at play like you've you've described. So that was another thing that we were thinking about putting in place to help repair those relationships, build trust yeah. back up and work on some of the issues. So the big question would be, how did you bring your those experiences from working in prisons um, with prisoners um, into being a great mediator? What, would, what did you sort of bring forward from that earlier career into sort of your career as a mediator? 
I think the uh, the offending behaviour programmes and facilitating those were um, were really helpful to build resilience and also manage impartiality, non judgment, all of those skills that you look at on mediation. I had kind of a, a strong foundation before I did my training because of the environment that I worked with, and then also working with people with multiple kind of needs, individual needs, um, having an awareness of that. Um, and having the empathy, I guess, um, to be able to work with people who have different things yeah. going on. And and you mentioned before as well, I didn't um, set off in, in the way that I intended. I set up a workplace mediation service, which is when we started to have more contact. Mm -hmm. um, and that held me in really good stead. So while it wasn't mediation in a pure sense, because I worked for the company that I was delivering, uh, facilitating mediation for, yeah. um, I was managing my own mediation service mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. I think that really helped me understand kind of from start to to finish some of the mm. the mm. Uh, mm. elements to the process so um the diversity so you're all right die you froze briefly you're back again um the diversity of ways that mediation can be used even just within that system so there's workplace mediation so staff staff disputes Mm -hmm. uh, short circuiting grievance type issues uh, dealing with allegations of bullying and harassment within the the echelons of the prison service amongst the staff that's what only that's only one disputes between uh, prisoners and staff um, is another one and that's been tried in various prisons with mixed success I've got to say um, so the idea of some of the prison officers training themselves training as mediators to mm -hmm. then to resolve disputes that's a tricky one because of the power imbalances and the um the signals it gives out if the prisoners are seen to be sort of getting too cozy with the prison officers i think that's been an issue uh, that we've had as well um and some of the stuff to do with gang membership within prisons is, uh, of course um so that, that's a tricky one and then to do with rehabilitation so mediation the kind of thing i was talking about with families and that you were talking about as well about getting people into accommodation and looking at um you know sort of dealing with some of the sharp corners involved in those systems and, and then the overlap with RJ and mediation. So what what for you is, so you, you said already in uh, in restorative justice, there is um, a definite identity of there's a victim and there's the offender and it's very victim-centred. I think that makes it quite different from mediation. Um, yeah. So have, have you sort of, um, did, did you make that transition okay then into the sort of the mediator rather than the RJ practitioner? Yeah, I mean, it's a while ago now, Mac, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I think so. It's similar in terms of the the kind of the process and the setup. Um, but there's a lot more focus on, you know, the safeguarding security. You're working with somebody who's in custody and then somebody who's outside of, of custody as well. So um, the, the process is a lot longer mm. uh, for the most part. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of, of skills that you mm. would use in in both scenarios that okay. we've done our training and paul has, has uh, commented he said uh, you talked about working with offenders and build uh, building your empathy die um can you say something about the ways that empathy is a useful tool for a mediator well we we know that empathy is at the heart of what we do as mediators it's about getting into people's frame of reference stepping into people's realities and trying to support equally both parties um to get to some kind of a, a, um, a solution what about empathy with offenders? Some people, out, perhaps outside of this field, might think, "What? You know, we can't empathise with offenders; they've done wrong." You know, but um, have we got any thoughts about that? Yeah, so I think the main part is the, I guess, the non-judgment. So just being accepting that that is somebody's reality, that's their truth, and you don't need to, you know, like it or respect it or agree with it it's just about accepting that that's what they are experiencing in the moment and, and what your role is and kind of leaving your own noise to the side so yeah. that you can do the, the role that you're there to do essentially sure thing and i know from my own experience early on um when i started in mediation from moving from sort of psychotherapy practice into doing mediation i did do some restorative justice work uh, around the Midlands in Leicester in particular and it took me a little while to learn this idea but 
um, yes, the, when it comes to you, you've got a victim, you've got an offender, but actually you don't know what's been going on in the history of that relationship between the two. And actually, if you'd have got involved a year before, the roles of victim offender might have been reversed because you can often get uh, uh, dyads or groups of people who are offending against each other a lot of the time. Uh, and actually, they take they take it in turns to have the role of the victim and the role of offender. So it's it's just taking just taking a snapshot doesn't give us a realistic picture. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's just bring it forward a little bit then. And three or four years ago, you were interested in got interested in mental health first aid and started to get involved in that. Let's talk about that a little bit, Di, please. Yeah. So I, I had about ten years in the prison service, and I decided I wanted to move. I was in the Midlands at this point. I wanted to move back up north. Um, so I went into the probation service. I was a senior probation officer for a time for the Northwest Probation Service, working with breach work. So working between the courts and the probation service around um, breach of community and suspended sentence orders. So from there, so I had about a year in the probation service. And then from there, I moved back up to the Lake District, which is where I'm based and got a role as head of people in a four-star hotel so this is where the HR qualification came uh -huh. in <laughs> because I you know I didn't have a HR role previously but I had the transferable skills to be able and the experience to be able to to go into that role mm -hmm. um, and working in the hospitality industry in the Lake District has different challenges which some of which are quite similar to the prison service as well uh -huh. So I wanted to focus more on the well-being of employees and that kind of prompted me to do my training in mental health first aid and deliver that in-house to managers. So that's something that I also do alongside mediation on a, on a freelance basis now that I've left the hotel. Sure thing. And we, we did a bit of work um, a little while ago about uh, mental health and conflict resolution, uh, mental well-being and conflict resolution, and we've delivered and designed a, you know, a course around that as well. Um, I think there's a big tie-up, isn't there, with mental well-being and not just the how that might affect how you get drawn into conflict but how and how you handle conflict, but actually the impact of conflict can really have a quite a profound effect on people's mental health as well. Um, yeah absolutely and you, and you see that in a lot of cases and it, and it works both ways like you say so um poor mental health can exacerbate conflict situations and contribute to the whole kind of tangle of stuff that's going on for somebody but mm -hmm. also things like going through conflict and being involved in formal processes which we've talked about mm -hmm. previously mm -hmm. can add another layer of stress and distress mm -hmm. to somebody who's already um experiencing kind of well-being issues mm -hmm. or dip in their well-being yeah absolutely and uh, as, as we discussed before you know it's not just about mental health which tends to be in the workplace tends to be that that sort of stress anxiety depression axis uh, but also um, uh, people uh, who are neurodiverse there can be uh, an effect there about dealing with conflict getting drawn into conflict and the impact of conflict on you as well and we've certainly had over 25 years quite a few cases where people are on the autistic spectrum quite clearly or where they have adhd uh, and other sort of um neuro neuro atypical conditions um where um that is an aspect and, uh, and sometimes they're not necessarily diagnosed but the likes of just to blow our trumpet the likes of you and me are likely to spot these things at the door i think aren't we Di? where they may not even have been picked up by the organization and while it's not our role to point these things out to people mm. I think it's fair to say we can have them at the back of our minds when we uh, try and work more effectively with individuals who may be, um, you know, of that of that uh, predicament. Yeah, and, and like you say, I think I try not to. You recognise behaviours and, and patterns of behaviours and ways of being that might fit in or fit under a certain label, and you, we're not there to label people or diagnose people. But I think having that awareness of how that might impact our um how it might influence the the mediation process can be really helpful mm -hmm. whilst making sure that you're not making a judgment about what's going on for that person so just treating people as as individuals really and being responsive to what's going on in the moment I think mm -hmm. is it yeah. is really helpful as a mediator without yeah. trying to put somebody into a into a box absolutely and, and just to come back to Paul's point as well I think in it is in a manner, some have called it advanced empathy. So that advanced empathy is about anticipating 
um, or having a greater understanding of why somebody's frame of reference or reality might be the way it is. And I think that little bit of knowledge around, for example, autistic spectrum disorder, you know, so if somebody is insistent on the detail of a of a of a situation or somebody wants to um to know a rule and always to stick to the rule, or if somebody is, you know, and the, it being a spectrum disorder, that doesn't typify every person with ASD, but you might notice a trait and think, oh, okay, this is important to this guy. Um, that he or she has this rule and wants others to stick to it, um, or wants the detail of a process or the detail of why a decision has been made, we may think, okay, that's characteristic of a particular condition. We don't need to say it. We don't need to label it. We're not diagnosing, but it might help with our advanced empathy um, and ultimately help to build that interpersonal bridge with the other person. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, just a little question here. We'll try and pick them up as we go along in case uh, in case we miss any. So Denise, thank you, Denise. So she's considering taking the training and she's wondering about um, freelance work. So you'd know all about that. Um, so is there work for independent mediators? Well, there does appear to be work for independent mediators in your experience, Di. So, um, yeah. And I'm aware that um, I think you were still working full time when you started to do some freelance work. Is that right? Yeah, I think... Things just aligned quite nicely for me because I'd done the training with yourself with UK Mediation. I set up the workplace mediation service. I sought supervision and advice from you and, and looked at, at different training that was available for other people in the company. We, I kind of had a relationship with UK Mediation in that sense. Uh, we knew of each other. So mm -hmm. when I went to work in the hotel as head of people, at the same time, when I was looking for that job, I approached yourself Mike and asked about doing some freelance work yeah. so I took that on and um, so I was still working full-time but then I was also doing some mediations and some training courses as well at the same time so working in hospitality I had some flexibility around when I worked you know it didn't have to be nine to five it could be weekends later shifts things like that so I could move my schedule around and I found that really helpful to kind of filter in the freelance work to the point where I was able to then say, right, okay, I'm going for it. I'm going to do it now mm. and, and quit my job and um, go for it, essentially. Took the leap. Yeah. So, um, and we do, we, we find we have that conversation with a lot of people, um, you know, about is there freelance work, Denise, you're asking, is there much work out there for independent mediators? There is, but mm. if you train as a, a mediator or if you train as a coach or if you train as an actor, or if you train as a plumber, or if you train as a as a, a, a railway, I'm not a railway worker, but a, a roofer, you've got to market yourself. Um, if you're going to get the freelance work, you do need to go knocking on doors. It's good to use connections that you've got. It's good to think about whether you've got a specialism. Um, and for you, Di, you know, you've got a lot of strings to your bow. Um, so the mental health work, the, the, the background in prisons, et cetera, the background in HR and extensive training in HR. So, you, 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 you know, you, you, you sort of um, you've got lots of ways um, to get your foot into lots of doors in terms of, um, you know, getting that freelance work in your case while you were still working full time. Um, I'm a serial certificate collector, Mike. I like to yeah. keep <laughs> I'm looking on your wall there. You obviously don't boast about them. You haven't got one on the wall, on the wall behind you, but no, <laughs> they're, over there. they're over there, are they? All right. Yeah. Fact... <laughs> yeah. I've got quite a few hands and quite a few questions. Let's come to you, uh, Gerard uh, Tomley up the top there. You've got your hand up. So let's hear from you, Gerard. Hi. Uh, thanks, Mike. Just coming back to the neurodiverse point, Diane. Mm -hmm. um, like you say, we're not trained to spot it or diagnose it, but it may well just become apparent. If, like me, you've got no background in the science behind that, the training behind that, how do you deal with it? Well, two things. First of all, how do you deal with it? Do you just go, OK, I've got somebody here who you may think is on a spectrum. You might be right. You might be wrong. But I don't want to say different, but you'll, you'll spot, you'll sense something. Do you do you just run with it as normal, treat them the same way as everybody else? And unless and until you get to a point where you think, this person is now becoming, quote, difficult and what is difficult. But if they become problematic in some way, do you end the mediation and go, well, this isn't working? Or do you have to stand back and have a word with yourself and say, well, how, how do I work around this? How do I work with this? What, have you got any tips around that? I think the word you just used there, Gerard, is work with. How do I work with this? Yeah. Um, and I think you, you used the word they're becoming difficult or or problematic 
Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, it's just taking a step back and thinking, what does this person need? Not taking it personally. It's some, it's something about what they need from the process. So I think you can manage that in a in an indirect way because it can be quite difficult to get a sense of somebody from the short space of time that you're working with them. Um, and you don't necessarily need to stick a label on it. You can just ask, you know, what's working for you? What's not working for you? Is there anything that would make this more comfortable? Is it, you know, is there a different way of doing things? And working with the person to figure out what's what's going to be the best way forward for them. Um, yeah, and talk to them about it in a private session. And they may actually yeah, say, yeah. yes, I'm on a spectrum. I have these difficulties or I, I work differently. Mm. I had one, I only came across it once where it was an adult brother and sister in a property case. And at the start of the session, the plenary session, and, you know, you say at the beginning, um, let's get some ground rules, how we're going to behave and all of that. Um, and I always ask at the end, I'm sure everybody does, uh, has anybody else got any other uh, rules that they'd like to suggest? And the brother put his hand up and he was on a spectrum. But I didn't know this. And he said, um, if I put my hand up, can, I, can everyone just please stop talking? And it turns out he was he found it difficult to process information. He needed some time. He needed more time than everybody else in the room to process. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a really good thing for him to come up with. I put my hand up. Can we just stop for a minute? Yeah. And then everybody knew that he was just trying to process. It's a nice nice example, Jerry, and a great question. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, and I think it's about, um, I used the phrase earlier, building the interpersonal bridge. So does, does the second person understand what the first person needs? So, for example, mm -hmm. somebody on the spectrum might find it hard to filter out all the noise and yeah. it just gets overwhelming. So mm -hmm. stop now, you know, because mm -hmm. I can deal with all of this. Um, and also the thing I mentioned about detail, there was a, a dispute uh, one of our mediators worked with a while ago. The reason for the dispute is there'd been some restructuring, some decisions made within an organisation, which this guy hadn't had all the detail about why those decisions were made the way they were. And this had caused a, a major kerfuffle. And actually what they, they needed to do was to explain that this is why it had put this fellow into a spin, is that he needed detail. And, and nobody needed to mention uh, autism or ASD at all, but the fact was yeah. he, this is what he needed and it, this is how we built the interpersonal bridge. So it's a great question. Thanks very much. So we've got one from Nikki. Um, Nikki says, are you aware of any schools using mediation instead of restorative justice? I'm very aware of children being suspended um, often leading to exclusion and even into the proof or even prison and the process of them returning to school. And wonder if you think this may be a, um, an impactful tool about using mediation instead of restorative justice. Um, I am, as it happens, Nikki, and there was one in um, schools in Birmingham a little while ago. Uh, I'll try and think how I can direct you towards it. But the um, the reason it came to light was there was a disproportionate number of black and minority ethnic children or children from families who were um, in particular from African Caribbean backgrounds who were being excluded. And there was a sociocultural thing going on to do with how um, those children and their families would communicate with the school, actually at the school gates sometimes. There's quite a bit of conflict going on and it needed to be addressed because of the disproportionate number of exclusions and that's why they paid attention to using mediation in that way so yes um and oh so an organization has come to mind we 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 did quite a bit of training with this outfit who actually support schools when there are exclusions and one of the things they did was train as mediators to mediate disputes uh, between parents and teachers and also between the pupils and teachers um, so yes, we are. Short answer is yes, we are aware of schools using mediation instead of RJ. Um, and then one more, and then we'll get back to die. Um, and that's from A Balfour. I haven't got your first name. I'm thinking if doing the training, do you have support or are left to get on with it once training is complete? No, we give you unlimited support. We can't find your cases at UK mediation, but following the training, we will help you even with case supervision, even with consultative support. When you start to get cases, we invite and encourage people to stay in touch with us. We have a learner forum for when you've trained with us. So there's lots of resources there, all the videos, all the papers, everything you would need to set yourself up as a mediator, even including templates for forms and stuff like that. What we can't do is give you leads for cases. That's down to you uh, because of the diversity of people that we train and because of the numbers of people that we train which I believe we're up to about 6,000 people now after doing this for 25 years. So we can't find cases for you all um, or actually any of you. Um, we can employ, as we have with Di, 
Um, I, she... say, I can vouch for that. Absolutely. <laughs> Invaluable having that support and supervision when I was first setting up. Sure. Okay. Um, so let's get back to Di. Um, so uh, I think we've mopped up a lot of the comments now. Um, this time always seems to go really, really quickly. Um, a conversation we were having with you then enmeshed with us doing mediation cases and also doing some freelance work elsewhere, Di. Um, uh, uh, usually workplace cases with, with your caseload, where we do lots of other stuff as well, but workplace for you. And one thing that does happen, which newly trained mediators find, mm -hmm. is to do with the trend these days that organizations tend to refer people to mediation after the conclusion of a formal process. So it tends to go through the grievance investigation and so on. And then the outcome from the investigation might be grievance not upheld, complaint not upheld. Uh, so we're going to refer, refer it for mediation. So for the audience here today, perhaps give a flavour of, um, you know, how that can impact on the atmosphere and the potential success of the case when they've been through this rather adversarial process already and then they get in the room with the mediator. Yeah, there seems to, or I seem to have had a few cases that are, are similar to that. And even where allegations have been upheld or partially upheld, where it's gone through to disciplinary um, I had a case where somebody had been suspended and they were due to return to work pending the mediation to assist with that process. So there's there's a lot of different ways that this can come about. But I think it just adds another layer to the conflict because the person who's been through the process, there's a lot of hurt there. I always say this, mm -hmm. there tends to be a lot of hurt and there's focus on the experience of the, the formal process that they've been through. Um, and that's something that we need to get past to be able to focus on mm. why that happened in the first place and how they can move on from that. Mm. So it can be helpful for them to, I guess, express how they're feeling about it, talk about it. Um, and that can be really helpful. We don't want to dwell on the past, as we say, uh, when we're training, but it can be really helpful just to verbalize what's going on internally but at the same time that kind of sets the scene to be quite pessimistic um, and it can feel quite negative so I think one of the the skills is to be able to recognize when that's helpful and when to to move on from that mm -hmm. and that's I think that's the the tricky thing where formal processes have taken place kind of allowing that space to work through that and then focus on okay right what happens next what are these behaviours, what are the issues, what are the concerns that we need to talk about to get your relationship back on track? Sure. We, we plead with organisations and our case managers here plead with organisations to refer the case before you go through the formal process. Uh, but it, unfortunately, it's, it doesn't work out that way. And I think sometimes an organisation needs to know that it has ticked all of their boxes in terms of going through the grievance, hearing from witnesses, taking statements of people, getting an investigation done in a very evidential um, what turns out to be an adversarial way, and then they think about mediation, which is for us is unfortunate because by the time you get there, you've set people against one another in a months long, sometimes rather win lose process, and then we get them in a room as mediators and say, right, forget all that, then you know, we'll focus on the future, which is just unrealistic because they are very aggrieved about not just the initial complaint that they put through their grievance about, but they're aggrieved about the process that was used in order to try and resolve it because. Yeah. Being so adversarial and so about you're right, um, you're wrong and I'm right type of thing. So, yeah, and it's it's so realistic just to say to people, right, forget all that, focus on the future. We do have to hear about their experience and the hurt that they have um, uh, that they've experienced from having gone through that thing. Um, I would say as well, there, there have been cases where the relationship is broken down during a formal process mm, as well. Um, mm, so it it doesn't necessarily have to have been around conflict in the first place but the, the the support that maybe was expected from a manager for example has maybe broken down or hasn't um been what somebody expected um and then that can be another kind of channel into mediation as well yeah you bet uh susie says the witnesses can be adversely affected too absolutely so we get that vicarious trauma with susie mm. People get drawn in, and often people don't want to get drawn in, but they kind of want to support their colleague that they've known for 20 years, but they haven't been part of the, the dispute, if we want to call it that. But they get asked to uh, to get involved um, and might be uh, questioned and cross-examined, in effect, 
uh, during a formal process. So you, you may even, like Dye says, the process can, can actually produce the conflict, let alone fail to resolve it. So you might find you're drawing more and more people into a conflict and you end up with a team dispute um, and uh, where you started with a one-on-one -on -one and you end up with uh, four or five parties involved. Mm. Uh, and there, there, there was a case that uh, you talked about with me, Di, um, and just coming back to the point about ongoing support, um, we give case supervision. I'm very happy to provide case supervision to all of our mediators and trainers and our mediators and trainers. And I, I honestly say it's a favourite part of my role these days. Um, is hearing about cases and working through with our mediators the things that can come up in cases. And one that Di and I spoke to a little while ago was a team dispute. Um, it was a multi-party case. Um, and I think it's a nice illustration of how cases, and it's sometimes not that pretty and don't go all that smoothly and do um, show that we, we are fallible as mediators or we don't know, we don't have all the answers or challenge ourselves and question ourselves sometimes. So I want to say a little bit about that, Di, with the times against us, but I'd, I'd be really interested, I'm sure the audience would be, to hear about you and this um, four-party case. Yeah, so it was a multi-party case for four parties. There had been a, um, some formal processes that had gone on. It turned out that... I was. I made the decision to get two of the parties together in the joint meeting. So you don't always know what the format's going to be with multi-party cases. You have an idea, and you know we work with the referrers um, in the best way we can. But you just don't know what the what the one-to-ones are going to throw out. So after doing the one-to-ones, the decision was made to to bring two people together. So one of the parties' concerns were out of scope of mediation because they were around formal processes and there was some kind of investigation going on there and the other party um, who didn't attend one of the others were just they weren't in the right frame of mind to have a conversation with that person at this time so I went ahead with the the two parties I also had some concerns about these two uh, because one of them was the one who put the grievance in the other one was, was had been suspended um, gone through a disciplinary process and there, there was that hurt there that we talked about there was some anxiety there about facing each other because it had been I think two or three months since they'd spoken to each other so I did have some concerns about whether it was the right thing to go ahead to the joint meeting but I also had some concerns if I didn't do anything and they went back to the situation as it was without going into the context um, the wider context of the situation I felt that it was better to get them together tentatively and, and work through the process rather than just leave it as it was. So I think I, I sought some supervision from Mike because it felt, or I felt, I guess, uh, there was pressure on me in terms of time because of the, the time in between the individual meetings, making the decisions, letting people know what's happening. Some people were traveling in, some people were on shift. And I had to think about confidentiality, who needs to know what. The referrer wasn't there. I was limited on what I could say to the other person. I had these concerns about how to manage the two that I was getting together. So I guess what, what I spoke through with Mike was just making those decisions and making sure everything was OK with the, the time that I had. But really, I did have time. I had, you know, a good few hours to work with the two parties going into the joint meeting we re I reflected that I could have maybe had an additional one-to-one -one with each of them maybe to prepare them a bit more for the joint meeting mm. so yeah I think that's mainly the the thing that we talked about in terms of managing changes to the format of the mediation as you, you're progressing through and making those decisions in the moment uh, when you are feeling quite pressurized mm. so just how to manage that really thing and and depending on the case sometimes we put two mediators on a case certainly with anything more than about three or four we would mm -hmm. depends what's going on really but we would put two mediators on it and there's some real value that's why we put on our training uh um an element of how to work with a co-mediator um so the value of having somebody at your elbow in the breaks or in the in the um uh, the moments in between seeing parties privately, uh, you can actually have a chat with your co-mediator and say, what <laughs> what should we do next? <laughs> or what's going on? Or uh, apportion the work as well. But have that, just the four ears are better than two. Uh, two brains are better than one. So, um, you know, it's a real benefit to having a co-mediator. But in the absence of that, um, you do have to make decisions on the fly, like you say, Di, you mm. know, and, and different cases are going to go different ways. 
I think it's sometimes a surprise to um, the referrer and the parties themselves in a four party like yours, where you make a very sensible decision and the right decision just to get two of them together for a joint session. And actually, the other two may not have anything to gain or to offer to that. Um, and perhaps they don't even want to be involved. Um, it's a tricky one to manage with referrers, especially when we get up to larger numbers like 11s and 12s, and um, because people feel they've been excluded. You might decide to get these five people together and the others are going, well, why haven't I been included? Um, and the fact is that they, they, they've nothing to gain or nothing to offer to that process. It's quite a tricky one. Yeah. I enjoy doing the multi-party cases, actually. I don't know what it is. Maybe I just like the pressure. <laughs> I don't know. Me but uh, that, that case, it was successful. They were able to reach an agreement. I mean, it, it was baby steps, but I felt I felt good about the decision-making after it had, it had been done anyway. Yeah. yeah, and it's a nice example of you bringing in your experience as well to go back, right back to the beginning, Di. You know, so you facilitating groups within prisons mm. uh, and working with numbers of people who... Um, I was going to say don't necessarily want to be there. So <laughs> uh, they certainly don't want to be in prison, but they don't necessarily want to be in that group. Um, and, um, you know, having to manage and facilitate that, that's something you're quite comfortable with. As yeah. mediators, and we're all different, some mediators would run a mile from doing a, a large uh, multi-party dispute. They'd rather just stick to the one-to-ones. I personally, I enjoy the team ones, and I these days enjoy working with co-mediators as well. Uh, when I, I remember when I first started out, I didn't like working with co-mediators. I had enough to think about. Um, yeah. I just wanted to get on with it, you know, and have my own thoughts to to deal with. Um, but these days, I I enjoy more winging it. I suppose it's something that comes with experience that you'd know about, uh, and and sort of um, you know working with somebody else as well. I can relate to that because I volunteer as well to get more neighbourhood um, mediation experience. And when I first started doing that, it, it was co-mediation and it took me a little bit of time to adjust. But there's a lot to be said. Yeah, for it. It's been really helpful, actually. Absolutely. And it's what I did, too. I mean, I, I trained back in um, it was about 1997. Uh, I've got grey hairs to prove it. Um, <laughs> The uh, and the, I wanted experience at the start, and a few people asking questions down this road as well. So, I'll just mention you know, to get experience as a mediator, it's a great idea to volunteer for a neighborhood and community service. Um, you might well get case supervision, um, included in that, uh, from the service. You'll certainly work with more experienced mediators, they might want you to do their usually quite short course. But if you would go into there with a level four accredited course that, you know, such as our interpersonal mediation practitioner certificate, uh, you might well, I'm not exaggerating, you might well be the best trained person in the service, but they might want you to do sort of their, to learn their admin and to learn how they, um, you know, how they pull the ropes um, and then go out with an experienced mediator and quite likely get case supervision. Even if you're planning on doing uh, other work like workplace or working with families it's great a good really good way to cut your mediation teeth is to do some neighborhood work early on um so you, you must get some um, hair raising cases with the neighborhood work diana i imagine that's one way of putting it yeah i guess it is it is a bit different i suppose yeah. it's usually more practical stuff i guess okay um on the surface you've got less time to work with people i think that's a, the main difference yeah. Okay. Been to, but yeah, interesting. Good. Uh, I'm going to roll up and down the questions just to see if we've picked everything up. So, uh, Anthony, you you said what training was that? And it was when Denise said I'm considering taking the training. Uh, Denise is was talking about considering taking our training. So it's the same training as as Diane did right back in the day. So um, Denise was considering taking the training, the interpersonal mediation practitioner certificate. Oh, I should be able to say it by now. <laughs> IMPC. We call it. It's much easier to uh, to say that than it is to say the other one. Um, and then a, a couple of other points. So we've got one from Julie who said, if I completed the two day online training course, would I learn enough to mediate in cases in the way Diane just spoke about? Um, I, I'd recommend you do the full accredited training, Julie. I think there's a lot more chance to practice. There's a lot more chance to get feedback off the trainer. I, you don't get as much to be frank, from doing a short course and certainly from doing an online course. So the the, the gold standard is the face-to-face 40-hour -face um, accredited training with assessment and you get the the, the stamp. Um, so you do get the accreditation at the end of it as well. You get to learn a lot about your own skills as a mediator, I think it's fair to say, Diane, as well. So, you know, we've alluded a couple of times to the mediators working in different ways. And I think it's a we, we, we very much encourage 
reflective practice and critical self-evaluation. So you, you get to learn about your own style and your own preferences as a mediator by doing the longer training. Um, so perhaps not, Julie. It might be good to do the full training. I'm just okay. reading Gary's comment. Thank you, Gary. I remember you. <laughs> That's nice. I'm trying to get the learners, uh, learners coming along. So, um, so A. Balfour, sorry, I haven't got your first name, A. Balfour. A typical mediation say we do workplace cases in a day. We tend to try and do cases in a day. So in the morning, hour and a quarter with each party. In the afternoon, three and a half hours, something like that, one till 4.30. I think, Di, that's plenty for most people, isn't it? They don't need more than that, or they couldn't take more than that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it is a long time. Some, I think you could be there all day if you needed to be. But yeah, that's a, a good amount of time. Yeah, OK. Um, and I've had a direct message off uh, somebody about um, asking about supervision. We can set up one-to-one -one supervision. Um, uh, we do need to charge for it. Sorry, it's time. Time is money. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'd be happy to set up a supervision arrangement with anybody who's trained with us. Um, would have to charge an element for the time. But if it's just a one-off case, which I think the, the messenger here is uh, asking about, it's just a conversation about a case I'm working with, of course, there's no charge for that. Just get in touch, um, that person who sent that direct message, and um, yeah, we can set something up there. Uh, Tracy says she's got a multi-party case at the moment. I might need to chat with you. Hang on a moment. I'm, getting, I'm offering lots of free supervision here. A uh, multi-party <laughs> case at the moment. I might need to chat with you, Mike. Uh, like Diane, it's a tricky one. Yeah, same for you, Tracy. So just if it's a, a one-off case and you want to chat about, you're very welcome. Yeah, let's have a... Let's have a... Um, if you um, message me privately about that one, Tracy, then we'll set something up. No problem at all. And the course was excellent, says Tracy. Thank you for that. Um, and then... Um, uh, Gary doesn't have a question. Wants to thank Diane. She was my training. A great woman, great trainer. Ah, oh, there you go, Diane. Fantastic. Um, and that brings us to really the end of our time. We've gone over slightly, as, as I often, often do. Uh, so much to talk about. We we could almost do a part one and a part two for this one, Diane. Um, so, um, hey? <laughs> so uh, watch this. Watch this space. Um, so we are getting people coming along who want to be on conversations with a mediator, which is fantastic. Um, we'll announce a couple of those later on in the year, some mediators um, that uh, the audience might well have heard about, um, who are more sort of out there, who've done uh, uh, publications, and there's somebody um, coming along in November, some of you might have heard of. We'll, we'll, we'll announce that a little bit later on. Um, if you want to hear from any particular mediator, uh, this seems to be becoming very popular, this forum. So if anybody's got anybody they'd like to hear from in particular, let's do it that way around as well. Get in touch and we'll see if we can um, twist their arms like we twisted dice. Coming up today. And uh, thank you very, very much for everybody's contributions and questions and comments. Really, really good stuff. Um, special thanks to Di. If we were in a room together, we'd give her a, a round of applause at this point. Um, and uh, look forward to joining you on our next webinar. We're doing our next conversation with the media mediator in November. A couple of different things are happening between now and then. Um, so we look forward to having you join us again in the future. Uh, there is a link for all of our webinars on the website. Um, and we will be back again soon. So have a good weekend. Enjoy yourselves. And uh, we'll see you soon. See you then, Alex. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.